The sight of a flock of healthy, happy chickens is the stuff of homesteader dreams. But that image breaks a little when a bird isn't feeling well. Instead of striding around confident and alert, a sick chicken becomes a shadow of itself. When you see that a bird is acting abnormally, it becomes your responsibility to figure out how to fix the situation. Though you may have no experience before keeping birds, by necessity, you will find that you need to build up a bit of medical knowledge of your own to care for them through the ear. And unlike a family dog in the city, who often has their own vet who knows them by name, chickens are often squarely in your care alone. Now this lesson may be one of the hardest for a new chicken keeper to truly learn, as we'll be discussing trying to save lives and the sometime inevitable death of the birds that we've worked so hard to care for and raise. My hope is to equip you with the diagnostic tools to help you assess what's going on with a sick bird, give you options for common issues, and help you ready your heart for both success and failure. But first, a quick primer on healthy poop. Poop is always a good place to start when it comes to evaluating chicken health. It gives you feedback on what you can't see, the internal world of your birds. So in your morning chicken checkup, be sure to take a close look at their poop as you clean it up, as unsavory as they might sound at first. You should be familiar with the range of droppings a healthy bird can make. That way, if you spout something that looks off, you'll have an early tip off that somebody's under the weather. The stereotypical normal poop is a gray, brown, or black semi-solid tube with a white cap. The white stuff is the equivalent of chicken urine, the black stuff is the actual feces. As a side note, the white flecks you see in this video are just feather shaft bits from my birds. They're molting. Now this isn't to say that chicken poo is consistent though. Healthy poop can come in a surprisingly diverse array of colors, depending on what the birds have been eating. Green poops can be a sign of spring when birds are back on pasture and gobbling up as much greenery as they desire. There are occasions when a chicken may slough off intestinal lining as a part of normal growth. Then, they have a poop that looks like a bit of red string laced through mucusy goo. Inky black poops can sometimes be caused by diet rich in sunflower seeds or by eating wood ashes that have been mixed in the dusting area. Even occasional foamy poop is nothing to be concerned about. Now another normal poop that might give the newbie pause is the broody poop. If you have a hen sitting on eggs, she will faithfully sit on them for hours and hours on end. As a result, she carefully waits to poop until later so that she doesn't soil the nest and the eggs inside. And when she does, the poop is giant. So big, it might make you actually gasp when you see one for the first time. It's stinkier than you can imagine too. Now don't worry, there's nothing wrong with her. It's just a normal part of raising babies. Just don't step in that one. I'll have a link in the resources sections about two sites that you can visit to see a much more comprehensive survey of healthy and sick chicken poop. You can check out an excellent post from the Fresh Eggs Daily blog, as well as a good, and I mean, by that I mean kind of gross, series of images from allotmentgarden.org. If you're having some particular trouble, you can also always start a question thread in the chickens topic of the insteading community, and we can do further troubleshooting there. Now let's talk about symptoms of problems. It's a really good practice to take time to observe your flock every day. Not only will it help you build up your general knowledge of chicken behavior and build up a good working knowledge of your individual birds, but it'll also help you see if something is amiss. Now, one of the most frustrating things about a sick chicken is the fact that they try to hide it for as long as possible. As a prey animal that pretty much any predator would want to eat, it's in a chicken's best interest to not look like easy pickings. As a result, you may find that when a bird that looked totally fine yesterday is suddenly sick, it might have been sick for a while. Usually when a bird looks bad, there's a problem to address and it may have been there for a few days without your notice. Now, of course, there's a huge range of clues that can reveal a sick chicken. Here's some of the first signs and symptoms that something is wrong. If you start to familiarize yourself with these, you may even be able to pick out a sick bird before she starts to show it. The first one, again, poop, I know, poop. Unusual poop though. Sick poops look grosser than the usual gross, and they often have a distinctively different bad smell that might catch your attention before the sight of them even does. These are droppings that you really don't wanna find like bright red bloody droppings, yellow droppings, all white droppings, loose puddly droppings, and worm wriggling droppings. These are sure signs that something is not right. A soiled vent. I know we're not done talking about poop yet, but as you may have observed through watching your flock, chickens have a very particular way about keeping their feathers preened and dusted clean. So if you see the feathers below a chicken's vent caked with droppings, you can bet something's off. A bird who can't keep herself clean is a bird who is not feeling well. Anemia. A lethargic chicken with a pale comb and waddles may be anemic. 
Now, anemia is usually never a problem on its own. It's always a symptom of something deeper that's going on. Sleeping in the day. Chickens are firmly and fully diurnal birds. So if you see a bird standing and sleeping in the daylight, you know something's not right. Fluffed up feathers. A bird that doesn't feel well will often fluff up its feathers, no matter what the actual temperature is. It makes the silhouette of the bird much more round than usual. Extra night sounds. When chickens are roosting for the night, they usually make quiet, pleasant cooing sounds or a slight worried hum if you open the door and shine a light on them. But if you hear other sneezing, gulping, gurgling, rattling, or any other weird sound at night, that's not normal. Somebody's probably sick. Now here are some common problems and options for treating them. As with any discussion on health and treatment of problems, opinions and methods vary wildly. As I discuss the symptoms, internal and external treatments of each issue, remember, I come from a background of treating my animals with only natural methods, and I accept occasional losses. All I can offer is my opinions, experience, and knowledge, and not any promise or guarantee that these will be successful every time. Let's start with parasites. Now, the only times I've really had to deal with parasites is when new birds have come to our land from other farms. This was specifically in our first few years when we were building up our flock from scratch. If you likewise buy surplus birds, adult birds, from other farms, try to take a peek at their housing conditions if you can. If there's lots of birds crowded together, you may be quietly informed that your birds probably have parasites. So before we get into the specifics of treating common parasites, let's briefly discuss quarantines as a means of protecting your home flock when you introduce a new bird. This is a practice that involves briefly isolating a new chicken and observing her for two to four weeks in a separate area before allowing her to rejoin the flock and normal life. This quarantine is only meant to be temporary and it allows you to see if any parasitic freeloaders accompanied your new bird. If you don't find them, hooray! She is safe to meet and mingle the flock. And if you do find them, it allows you time to remove and treat them before bringing that bird into the coop. Dealing with worms in one chicken is a whole lot easier than dealing with worms in a bunch of chickens. Now, one of the first problems that you could encounter is coccidosis. This is a disease caused by protozoa that are present everywhere, but particularly concentrated in overcrowded environments. It's usually a problem for chicks. The symptoms are anemia, blood in loose droppings, mucus at the corners of the eyes, and hunched backs. For internal treatment, crushed garlic mixed in their food, honey mixed in their food, and apple cider vinegar mixed in the water can help. But really, you need prevention. And the prevention for coccidosis is to raise chicks under a mother hen, raise them in the spring, don't overcrowd them, keep the brooding areas cleaned daily, raise chicks in a tractor that can be moved to fresh ground daily, and to not let chicks drink dirty water. Feather lice. Symptoms of feather lice are bald patches on the birds from them scratching incessantly, lice visibly crawling around on the skin when the feathers are parted, specifically look around their heads, and little white sticky clumps of lice eggs on the feathers themselves. External treatment is to isolate the affected birds, dust with cool ashes by hanging the birds upside down. The feathers will be pointing the wrong way, and so this way this will allow the cool ashes to reach their skin directly, and lice do not like ashes. For internal treatment, feed birds minced garlic cloves or finely chopped garlic leaves mixed in their food. Parasites in general hate garlic, so you're going to hear a lot about garlic in this parasite section anyway. For prevention, quarantine and observe new birds before introducing them to the main flock. Always provide a dusting area for your chickens and spread clean, dry ashes in dusting areas. You can also, for the record, use diatomaceous earth to the same effect, but ashes are free. Leg mites. Symptoms of leg mites are legs with upraised scales like a pine cone rather than laying nice and flat and smooth. Seriously affected birds will walk stiffly due to the pain. For internal treatment, again, feed birds minced garlic cloves or finely chopped garlic leaves in their food. For external treatment, rub the shanks daily with vegetable oil until mites are suffocated and the condition improves. The bird that you see me treating in this video actually doesn't have mites, but you can see the same process. For prevention, quarantine and observe new birds before introducing them to the main flock, and coat the legs of the flock and the perching areas with vegetable oil once a month in case you suspect it could be a problem. Intestinal worms. Symptoms of intestinal worms are anemia, yellow poop, loose poop, wormy poop, a skinny bird that just won't gain weight, or birds with reduced egg production. For internal treatment, remove the affected bird from the flock, and feed them a carrot, cayenne, and garlic-added diet as worms are expelled and their condition improves. 
Apply this treatment for at least 10 days, all the while scrupulously cleaning the chicken's house to remove worm eggs, and you will almost certainly see improvement. There are chemical warming medications, but they typically render all the eggs the bird lays inedible until the bird has gone through withdrawal from the drug. If you want to go that route, you'll have to research each drug individually to know how to apply it. For prevention, rotate chicken pastures to fresh ground and prevent coops and runs from having bare ground by constantly applying dry material. Make sure that puddles can't form in the chicken yard and string bird netting around the enclosed run to prevent wild birds from entering because sometimes their poop actually contains parasite eggs. Feed your chickens a worm-unfriendly diet as a tonic. This includes shredded carrot, onions, garlic, cayenne, mint, hyssop, blackberry leaves, whatever you have available in that list. Pumpkins and their seeds are also a wonderful worm preventative to just add to the diet on a regular basis. Essentially, a healthy chicken in a healthy environment has natural defenses against the many types of worms and will rarely have trouble even if they're exposed. As animal herbalist Juliette de Baracli Levy writes, the free-ranging farm hen is singularly free from worms. The commercial exploited hen is rarely without them. Let's talk now about cannibalism, an unpleasant thing, but this includes feather picking, proud flesh, and just all out eating a chicken. The symptoms are chicks pulling out and eating blood-filled growing feathers from their flock mates, chickens pecking spots on other chickens repeatedly until there, are, until there are unhealing wounds, and chickens killing and eating other chickens. All I can offer for this one is prevention, because this is a symptom of bad flock management. Your birds are lacking important nutrients, they're bored, overcrowded, or all the above. Give your birds more protein, give them more space, and rethink how you're running your coop. Overmating. Symptoms of this are bright red, sunburnt, featherless patches on hen's backs from where the rooster has repeatedly mounted them. They may even also be bleeding from where he has scratched them with his spurs. For external treatment, you can apply honey or aloe to the broken skin, isolate the rooster while his hens recover, and you can even fit featherless areas with temporary mating saddles. For prevention, you need to have an appropriate sex ratio of roosters to hens. Don't anthropomorphize the rooster and accuse him of being lascivious. It's not his fault. This is a natural part of his makeup that you need to handle appropriately by giving him a big enough flock. One healthy rooster can handle 10 or more hens in his flock and should have at the very least four hens. Animal attack. Symptoms can be puncture wounds from teeth and talons or raw gaping wounds. For internal treatment, if the chicken can eat, give it crushed raw garlic to the food because it's a great antibacterial that can help fight infection. For an external treatment, you first got to wash dirt and foreign material from the wound with a sterile saline solution. I have used contact solution with good results because you can really squeeze those bottles and get the wound cleaned out effectively. Then apply honey over all open wounds and cover with a bandage. Then remove the chicken from the flock. The other birds can peck at the sight of blood and that doesn't make the problem any better. Keep the wounded chicken protected from flies, especially. They will lay eggs on exposed skin, and the maggots that hatch can infest the wound with fly strike, which is a whole problem that you do not want to have to deal with. Replace the plantage daily to make sure that it's clean. For heat, stress, or overheating, the symptoms of this are chickens panting rapidly, holding their wings far from their bodies. For internal treatment, make sure that your birds have plenty of cool, clean water, especially in the heat of summer. For external treatment, make sure your chickens have access to shade without being crowded together. Chickens that are exposed to temperatures above 105 degrees Fahrenheit without relief can die. The only disease I'm really going to mention is Merrick's disease. Uh, this is a virus-induced cancer that can cause a range of symptoms from discolored eyes to skin tumors. You have to expect that basically all chickens are exposed to it in some degree. It's spread in part through feather dander, so once one chicken has it, it's very likely that the whole coop has been exposed. There isn't a known effective treatment, and even the methods that have been depended on to fix the problem have really done more harm than good in the long run. As you can read in the National Geographic article that I list in the resource, they're the reason the disease mutated from a rarely deadly disease to a very deadly disease. It's because of the leaky vaccines that were used to try to stop this. The only course of action that I've seen for treating Merrick's disease is prevention and support. So for prevention, the best thing you can do is have unstressed chickens, because unstressed chickens in a clean environment are typically strong enough naturally to resist succumbing to diseases, including Merrick's disease. It typically only takes down birds that have become stressed for whatever reason, and therefore are weaker. Some research also indicates that raising chickens alongside turkeys can give them a natural immunity. It is possible for a chicken to recover from this too, so don't give up on your whole flock if one goes down. Pasting or pasty butt. 
The symptoms of this one are droppings that collect in a soft drown around a new chick's vent, drawing one atop the other until they made a dangerous plug over the chick's vent, preventing elimination. This only typically affects chicks under a week old. For internal treatment, you can mix cornmeal or ground up raw oatmeal in the chick's food. For external treatment, you'll need to daily and gently remove droppings from around the vent so that the chick can keep pooping. You can use dabs of warm water and as light a touch as you can. The skin around this area is so delicate for a chick. If the chick gets wet in this process, use a hairdryer on low to get it warm and fluffy again as soon as possible. For prevention, first, if you raise chicks underneath a mother hen, if you have that option, I've never seen them have this problem. If you're raising chicks without a mother hen, you can raise them on natural food, which will also help. You need to also prevent the chicks from being exposed to temperatures below 45 degrees during their first week. Again, after the week, the chicks should get over this and be on their way to growing up stronger. Now let's put this all together. Here's an example of how you can identify, diagnose, and treat a problem. This problem happened while I was filming this class, and it has a happy ending, thankfully. I hope it's an encouragement to you that you can likewise assess and apply the information you've learned in this class to confidently solve problems with your own birds. So take a look at this picture. It's one of my Rhode Island red hens in the early spring of this year. You'll notice that she just looks big and is certainly fluffier looking than the birds around her. Though it was a hot day, she's all poofy and looking miserable. That was my first clue that something was up. After I took the photo, I could see that she was not interested in food at all like the other birds were, and she was unusually disengaged. I removed her from the flock, and the problem became clear as soon as I picked her up. Her crop felt mushy like a half-filled water balloon. In my hands, I could also hear that she was making weird gurgling sounds when she breathed. She had something called sour crop. Now, I had just started reintroducing grass and weeds into my chicken's diet now that the spring growth had returned, and I'm assuming that she had eaten a little too much a little too fast, even though the rest of the birds had handled it fine. With a bit of a clog in her crop from the long grass strands, she had been drinking tons of water, and since the water couldn't get through, it had just sat in her crop fermenting. That's why it's called sour crop. So, it was time to take action. Quickly, so as to not cut off her breathing for too long, I held her upside down and gently massaged her crop. Probably a third of a cup of bad-smelling brown liquid immediately drained from her mouth. I only held her upside down for about five seconds at a time, by the way. That way she could breathe between each upturn. After that, I put her back in the coop and gave her all the birds a few extra scoops of grit to help them break up the greens a little bit more easily. I put some apple cider vinegar in the drinking water as a tonic. It's nice for all the birds, and it would certainly help her crop balance itself bacterially in the meantime. So after massaging and draining her crop for two more mornings like this, she was back to her old self and totally recovered. So recovered, in fact, that she was the one who later brooded and raised the mixed chicks that you've been seeing through this whole course. Now let's talk about some things that aren't problems. Thankfully, not everything that looks weird is bad. Here are some things that you actually don't have to do anything about if you notice them. First one, maggots and droppings. Flies are gross, and they like to lay their eggs in poop. Maggots, fly maggots specifically, in your chicken's droppings merely mean that the flies found the poop before you did. That might be a less than savory hint that your coop could use a bit of cleaning and some fresh bedding, though. Molting. Now, a molting bird has all the signs of a sick bird at first. She might have a pale comb, she might have pale waddles, she'll be standoffish, she'll look terrible. Feathers will come off in clumps, and she may even be bald in some places. She'll probably even stop laying eggs. The feathers she does retain will be fluffed out at weird angles. Thankfully, molting is a totally natural and good process. This is the seasonal replacement of a chicken's plumage. It gives her a fresh coat of warmth right before she really needs it in the cold of winter. So how do you know when a bird is just molting and not actually in the middle of a horrible parasite infestation? Here's some clues. First, you should know that chicks and pullets don't really molt. They may lose an odd feather or two, but not chunks of plumage. A sudden bald patch on a bird under a year old is a bad sign. Second, molting occurs in the fall. If you notice a southern feather explosion in your croup as the leaves begin to turn, you can pretty safely guess that that's not a problem. Third, all your birds are working hard growing on new feathers in the bald patches. You should see the needle-like pins of new feathers poking up through the spare skin very quickly. Skin left totally bare for more than a few days is really abnormal. As you'll see, molting is a pretty individual process, too. One bird may do it gracefully and slowly over the course of a few weeks, only appearing slightly scruffy, while another may awkwardly drop huge chunks of feathers and then regrow them just as quickly. To support molting chickens, try not to handle them during this time. Those growing feather barbs are sensitive. And give them some extra protein if you can. Mealworms, bug, grubs, pumpkins and their seeds, and meat scraps will all be an appreciated protein boost as they work hard on making all that new feather material. 
Here's another one that's not a problem, but it's a tough one. Runts. They exist. They're inevitable. Whether you raise a batch of chicks from the feed store or have one of your hens catch your own clutch, you may notice that one of the brood is just smaller than the rest. For whatever reason, runts just often don't have what it takes to keep going. Anticipate that runts may die for no apparent reason out of the blue, and try not to get it too attached to them. This happens naturally, both in the wild and in the barnyard. If you're trying to breed your own birds, this is actually kind of a blessing in disguise. It means that your strongest birds are the ones who reach adulthood and make strong offspring the next year. Now, pale combs and wattles after laying an egg are not, also not a problem. Though a pale comb and wattles is sometimes a tip off of a sick chicken, it also happens to a hen who has just laid an egg. It's hard work, especially in the heat of summer. So if you observe a bird who's looking off color, first check to see if she just gave you breakfast before you assume she's sick. A subdued rooster. Fall and winter are not the times for breeding in chicken land. It's the time for laying low and surviving the cold. As such, you will probably notice that your rooster is quite diminished in the colder months. His comb may shrink and become a more muted red. His splendidly long tail will molt off. He'll stop crowing and he'll stop mounting hens. This is normal. It takes a lot of energy to be big and brash and virile all spring and summer, and he needs a winter break to recoup. But don't worry, come spring and warm weather, he'll be back to his flashy Casanova self in no time. Now here's what to do when there's nothing you can do. Sometimes a bird just can't be brought back from the brink. Maybe you found a hen that somehow survived a raccoon attack, but she's missing a whole lake. Maybe you didn't notice a wound under your free-range rooster's lush plumage and only discover it once fly strike has set in and it's infested with maggots. Maybe a pullet with weak genetics ends up with a horribly prolapsed vent after trying to lay her first egg. Now you have a suffering animal in your care, and you're the one who has to decide what to do. If you believe that a bird is suffering and can't recover, there is absolutely nothing wrong with putting it out of its misery. Sometimes, by the time you have figured out that that bird is sick, it's too late to do anything but humanely kill it. I know that sounds cold, but honestly, sometimes that's the most caring thing you can do as their keeper. I can't tell you when that point is. Some people are dedicated to eyedropper feeding a sick hen through the night and actually do, on occasion, get her back on her feet. Some people use the chopping block as their vet, ending needless suffering with one swift stroke. Sometimes a bird will die no matter how much attention you lavish on it. Sometimes a bird that seems like it's on death's door can rally itself after a bit of rest and quarantine. This is the stark reality of keeping livestock. You might consider taking a chicken to be put down at the vet, but it's expensive. The trip is traumatic, and some vets might not even be willing to deal with a chicken. Then the task is in your hands. Killing a chicken is actually a relatively simple endeavor if you are confident and calm. There are quite a few methods than range and ease and gore, but the best way that I know is to just cleanly chop the head off. Then it's obvious if you've done the job right and the chicken really has no idea what hit it. Suffering is non-existent. To make the process as calm and swift as possible, I strongly recommend using a feed bag with a bit of the corner cut out. The goal is to put the chicken's head through the hole while the rest of its body is held close and tight in the bag itself. This keeps it from flailing around in a panic and it lowers the stress level for everyone involved. Then, all that needs to be done is to get a block of wood and a sharp butcher's knife or a hatchet. Gently stretch the chicken's neck over the wood, and then, when you're ready, remove the head with one swift, sure, strong blow. If you can't do it confidently, get someone who can. This is not a time to be wishy-washy. Then, still holding the bird's body in the bag, hold its wings tight and steady. They'll be reflexively trying to flap. It's just an automatic reflex and hold the chicken down so that you can direct the blood into the ground where it can just soak in and be at rest. Don't worry, in a minute it'll all be over. Now you have a few options for disposing of the body. In the instance that the problem was a sudden one that befell an otherwise completely healthy bird, such as the prolapsed vent example, that bird would be fine to continue butchering for human consumption. We're not going to get into that in this class, but it does give you a way to make sure that a perfectly good chicken doesn't go to waste. If the chicken was torn apart by other animals, riddled with parasites, or a wasted away sick bird from some sort of unknown cause, don't eat it. The remains could probably be fed raw to your farm dog if he's used to raw meat. They can be buried at least three feet under the ground, or they can be burned. Now I know this is a rather dire note to end this lesson on, but I want to emphasize something to hopefully allay any fears and misgivings. If they are given what they need in a clean, spacious environment, chickens are naturally healthy and problem-free. 
If your experience is anything like ours, you'll have a few of these issues in the first year or so of keeping chickens, but we'll probably have chickens that are stable and happy once the flock is established and you know what you're doing. Don't let the initial hiccups discourage you to the point of wanting to quit and learn from your mistakes.